Hey, welcome everyone. The Center of Excellence in Smart Construction is pleased to present this virtual seminar, Green Hydrogen, Innovative Renewable Energy Solutions for Net Zero Carbon. My name is Dr. Wendu Oguda, and I'm the Center Manager for the Center of Excellence in Smart Construction. Please note, we are recording this webinar and all lines are muted. If you need help at any time, please send us a message via the chat box, the Q&A chat box. Today's event will last up to 60 minutes. We encourage you to ask questions throughout the event. Similarly, type them into the Q&A chat box in the lower center of the screen, and then be sure to click the send button. The Center of Excellence in Smart Construction is committed to advancing industry-led innovations in the built environment that will revolutionize the way we develop, manage, and operate smarter cities. CESC partners with like-minded organizations and government entities to lead the transformation of the built environment and development of the next generation of professionals for the benefit of the economy. The center is a global hub for disruptive thinking, a platform for collaborative research and a model for solutions development and stakeholder engagement. The center's industry-led research and development has a focus on enabling technologies around three main research themes, performance and productivity, sustainability, and well-being. The collaboration is intended to provide leadership in the future direction of the industry that will inform policy decision makers. We would also like to acknowledge as a center our five industry partners who have been integral to the development of the center and our engagement with industry. It's now my pleasure to introduce our esteemed industry and academic experts. Dr. Yanis Spranas is the regional manager for Kio. He's a consultant, professional engineer, and sustainability with experts with 20 years of experience. As Kio regional manager, he provides professional consultancy and strategy related services to government institutions, investment funds, developers, architects, and contractors. His experience includes the development of sustainable real estate assets, renewable energy and urban development programs in MENA, UK, Europe, and Africa. Following his doctorate, he has provided consultancy and advisory services for the development of projects within commercial, education, healthcare, hospitality, leisure, master planning, mixed use, renewable energy, regeneration, residential, and sports sectors. Since 2013, he's based in the Gulf region and works closely with world event organizers and developers of future global destination. His primary interest is in the implementation of added commercial value through client-focused sustainability, related decisions on early stages of developments. He's currently delivering organization-wide scale strategies to some of the signature clients in the region. Dr. Evangelia Toproskika is Assistant Professor of Building Services Engineering at Terrell University. She holds a PhD from Brunel University, London on the experimental and computational study of a solar power hydrogen production system. And her research focuses on green hydrogen power to X applications, renewable energy and sustainability in the built environment. Ian Sutherland is Senior Project Manager at Jacobs Engineering. Ian is one of Jacobs subject matter experts in the use of hydrogen as a route to achieve the decarbonization of an organization's operations and assets. He has deep knowledge of hydrogen technologies and the application in holistic systems to provide power for mobility and static needs. He's currently working with colleagues in the Jacobs Global family to communicate to clients the sustainability, resiliency, 
and cost benefits of investing in hydrogen systems. Professor Mohamed Al Mankibi is a research director professor at NTP University of Lyon and a member of the LTDS laboratory of La Ecole Centrale of Lyon. He has a PhD, PhD degree in hybrid ventilation control strategies design and assessment and accreditation to direct and manage research. He's the manager and supervisor of building related courses of NTP and co-creator and co-manager of a green building master's degree. Highly involved in NTP's green and low impact building design and optimization program. He has two major fields of research. One is related to the dynamic simulation of thermal and aurelic phenomena in buildings. And the other one is related to the development of multi-objective optimization. I will now hand over to to Dr. Yanni, our moderator for this evening's webinar. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Guda, for the introductions. And thank you, Harriet Watt, for inviting us to this interesting panel. Uh, the topic is quite interesting, and a lot of people start discussing the hydrogen production and hydrogen use, especially when we look following the Paris Agreement, how globally we'll move uh, towards uh, full decarbonization. Uh, the topic is not something new. W one of my favorite books is The Hydrogen Economy, which was published 20 years ago, and in some ways was provided a blueprint how the global hydrogen economy could move forward. Uh, this panel today brings the knowledge of some of uh, global experts, and I, I would like to give the microphone to Vagelia Topriska, who will give us a summary of the current developments, technological developments, and also how we can move forward. And after the presentation, we can move to the panel discussion. Vangelia. Yes. All right. Uh, hello, thank you, Yanis. Thank you, Dr. Wendu. Um, can you hear me well? Perfect. Yes, all right. So thank you very much. So I will start immediately with my presentation. All right. Um, can you see it well? All right. So um, thank you. I'm very pleased today to be part of uh, this webinar on green hydrogen and innovative renewable energy solutions for net zero carbon cities. Um, Dr. Wendu already gave the introduction of uh, the center, so I will not go through the details again, but uh, by now it's clear uh, that there is a focus on sustainability and hence the topic of today is net zero carbon cities. So I would like to start uh, with some facts on hydrogen. Uh, so hydrogen is the most abundant element in the universe and it has the biggest energy content per unit mass of any other fuel. Um, in comparison to LPG, which is mainly used today, it is about four times higher. Uh, but it actually is not only uh, an energy fuel, but it is an energy carrier, which means that hydrogen can be used to store energy and to transport energy as well. Um, it can be produced from a variety of methods uh, and thus can help us uh, diversify our energy systems and also enhance energy security. And those methods I will show in, in the following slides. Um, it can be stored long term with negligible losses and quite safely actually. Um, also hydrogen can be integrated uh, with renewable energy. And uh, when we talk about renewable energy, one of the main issues is actually the fluctuating energy output, especially for wind and solar. Uh, but hydrogen can be used as a storage uh, system coupled with renewables quite efficiently. So all, all these uh, aspects make it quite flexible to decarbonize uh, hard sectors such as transportation, industry and buildings. And today what we see is a global trend, as it was mentioned also, uh, a global trend on more policies and more projects, uh, as well as um, um, more investments in R&D in uh, and hydrogen. Uh, so um, in the title of the webinar, actually, we see green hydrogen. So I would like here to explain what is green hydrogen. And when we talk about the colors of hydrogen, uh, what, are, what are they and what they mean? So we, we focus more on the low carbon hydrogen method, of course, when we talk about sustainable uh, hydrogen methods. 
So what is green hydrogen? It is basically electrolytic hydrogen and uh, the energy required for the electrolysis process comes from renewable uh, sources such as wind and solar. And this entails almost zero emissions. Uh, then we have the, the blue hydrogen, which is basically the hydrogen generation of, from fossil fuels like uh, steam reforming of natural gas or gasification of coal and biomass which are the most uh, traditional methods and the majority of the hydrogen today comes from these methods. So if uh, hydrogen from fossil fuels is coupled with carbon capture use and storage, then we have what we call blue hydrogen. And then of course we have the photochemical processes which are not as commercialized yet. And in many cases we can read about green hydrogen, which is again electrolytic hydrogen uh, supplied by, by nuclear energy. So um, overall, green hydrogen is still quite an expensive strategy if we compare it to the traditional fossil fuel based hydrogen methods. However, as today, what we want to achieve is low carbon and uh, blue hydrogen. Um, this is the, in this case, we need the carbon capture use and storage, which is quite a, a, an expensive technology. So here today we have an opportunity with a declining cost of renewable electricity, uh, we have an opportunity to uh, use more electrolytic hydrogen. And there is a growing interest in electrolytic hydrogen today. And uh, here in, in this map, I would like just to show uh, the costs of hydrogen from hybrid solar and onshore wind and uh, around the globe. And what we can see that uh, the costs vary between approximately around $1.6 uh, per kilogram to uh, four uh, or, or about uh, five and six dollars maximum. And uh, the projection is that by 2030, uh, this will even go down to $2.5 per kilogram uh, of hydrogen, which is actually quite good, especially if we compare it to what was 10 years back, which was uh, more than double of what we have today. So the prices are dropping. We have more and more projects on uh, green hydrogen and low carbon carbon hydrogen in general. And here in this in this graph, I would just like to point out that today uh, we have about less than two megatons of of uh, low carbon hydrogen being produced a year. But uh, by 2030, this is uh, predi pre projected to increase uh, fourfold. So green hydrogen. Um, is being used more and more, we have more investments. Uh, but how can, can, we ha can it help us achieve net zero carbon cities? Uh, all right, so um, before we move on to the net zero carbon part, I would like to show here some facts on cities of today. So today, 70% of the global carbon dioxide emissions come from cities and 75% uh, of the global primary energy is actually uh, consumed by, uh, by cities. And more than half of the global population today live in cities. And by 2050, this is predicted that it will be more than 70%, very, very high number. So cities are faced with many challenges and when it comes especially to sustainability and climate change, some of the major issues that we deal with are energy security. So how do we make sure that we always satisfy the energy needs of the population in cities of all the processes? How do we make sure we avoid uh, blackouts, power cuts? And at the same time, how do we make sure we don't deplete our energy sources? How do we move on from fossil fuel use to more renewable energy? How do we do proper waste management? So these are some of the major issues that we face today. And of course, when it comes to climate change, uh, we all know that temperatures are increasing. And especially in, the, in urban locations, we have what we call urban heat island effects of uh, higher temperatures in cities. So we have to design and we have to consider for systems uh, that will be resilient and will uh, be part of mitigation strategies uh, for, the cities, for the cities of the future. Uh, now, when it comes uh, to the carbon dioxide emissions uh, today, what we see by sector is that uh, the transportation sector, uh, along with uh, the industry and the power generation, uh, make up for most of the carbon dioxide emissions. Uh, because today we still rely a lot on fossil fuel, actually, in many urban locations around the world. And uh, these are followed by the building sector. All right, so when uh, we say we want to design for net zero carbon, 
So based on what we saw, um, the sectors that we need to focus more on are the building, transport, and industry. So basically, when we design for net zero carbon, we need to provide, uh, we need to design uh, with, with a view that there should be no carbon footprint. So uh, the buildings should be energy efficient. They should have more uh, smart automations, proper uh, uh, demand side management and uh, active and passive strategies. The transportation systems in the city have to be revamped, have to use alternative fuels. Uh, they And also the industry and uh, more renewable energy has to be used used in order to have a net zero carbon city and a city that can address the, the targets of the Paris Agreement and reduction of uh, greenhouse gas emissions. So um, in such a city, a net zero carbon city, how can green hydrogen actually be applied? Um, here we see in this graph by Irina, uh, I think it's very representative uh, of the case. So we can have renewable energy being produced on site or off site through offshore, onshore wind or solar, then the electricity generated will supply an electrolyzer plant. Uh, the hydrogen that is generated then will be transported, uh, stored as compressed gas or some other method or distributed through pipelines in the urban location. And then it can be used in the industry, in the chemical industry for ammonia production, for example, which is uh, mainly used today, or it can be used as alternative fuel for transportation, or it can be used straight in buildings uh, for direct combustion for heating systems or uh, for power generation in fuel cells. So uh, net zero carbon cities are actually not a dream of the future. Uh, we have some good examples today. Even in Abu Dhabi, we can visit Mazda City that um, is a plant to be a, a net zero carbon city. Uh, we have very good examples around the world. So here I will, in this slide, I would like to show how in, in such, some um, places around the world, we have a very good examples of hydrogen, green hydrogen used. Um, so uh, it's uh, for uh, the first point I would like to mention is hydrogen being distributed in the natural gas network. Uh, this is something that has been done in many countries and on a 20% volumetric basis, even the grid does not need any changes. So this is something that uh, ha happens um, a lot today. And then uh, hydrogen, green hydrogen is mainly used in transportation systems around the world. So we see here in these pictures, uh, the first uh, hydrogen train um, in Austria, the first hydrogen bus in Korea, the first hydrogen refueling station in Canada. And here is a map also of California where we have a lot of uh, fuel cell electric vehicles and hydrogen refueling stations. So we mainly use at the moment green hydrogen in transportation systems in, in cities. Now, uh, when it comes to buildings, um, there is still uh, some uh, path to cover here. And uh, at the moment though, we have some good examples and they're very, quite indicative of how green hydrogen can be used in buildings. Here in the top, we see a picture of a town in Japan where many of the houses, houses actually use hydrogen in fuel cells uh, for electricity generation. And through a combined heat and power system, they utilize the heat from the fuel cell. So the, the overall system is quite efficient, up to 80% combined. And um, the global ambition is that by 2030, we will have about 4 million houses around the world um, running on hydrogen or using hydrogen. Um, so, okay, here I would also like to show you some uh, projects that are um, being built or designed uh, for the coming years uh, that I believe are quite representative of what a green hydrogen, um, zero carbon uh, community or city uh, would look like. Uh, so many of these projects are in the north of Europe, some in the south. Um, we have some even in our neighborhood in Saudi Arabia, NEOM. Um, a few days ago, Dubai uh, announced that they would build a green hydrogen uh, project here. Uh, a lot is happening also, a lot is happening in Australia. So here we see the HiNet project, it's in the north of the UK, where hydrogen centrally uh, produced and distributed in the community to be used in transportation, to be used uh, as a fuel blending communities or industry. Um, here we see the North H2 project where uh, excess, I'm oh, sorry, generated electricity from offshore wind will supply an electrolyzer and then hydrogen will be distributed in the neighboring uh, countries and cities. 
So there are a lot of uh, projects today happening. And uh, just one final novel application I would like to mention here is that hydrogen can also be used as alternative cooking fuel. And this is a research I was involved in a few years back in developing communities. We introduced a green hydrogen system uh, where we store hydrogen in metal hydride in low pressure, and then we sent it directly to a stove where it was used as, um, as for cooking. And we, in this way, what we managed to achieve is replace traditional cooking fuels, which actually um, are quite problematic uh, in terms of indoor air quality. Um, all right, some of my concluding remarks uh, for this presentation is that, uh, of course, today we are still faced by many challenges when we talk about green hydrogen applications in zero carbon cities. Uh, there is a lack of infrastructure, uh, electrolysis plants in many cases need to be built from scratch and this entails high capital costs and uh, for hydrogen to become competitive on a building level, let's say in comparison to domestic heat pumps or gas boilers, the prices of today that are five or six dollars per kilogram have to go down to about 1.5 uh, dollars. So there is still some work to be done on that. And if we improve also the efficiency of the electrolyzer and the materials become cheaper, this will also help. Um, some other challenges that we're faced with is that so far, mostly the policies focused on transportation. Uh, but uh, what we need is more policies to help promote um, building applications. Um, all right, so overall, uh, yes, today there is an opportunity. Uh, what, there is a clear uh, understanding in governments today and private sector that is a key, green hydrogen is a key when it comes to climate change mitigation. Uh, so we do see more policies being announced and roadmaps uh, in Europe and Japan, Canada, Australia, around the world. So this is all quite poly, po positive uh, to, to, to feel that we have some support from, um, the, from the government and policies. Uh, so in conclusion, uh, I would just like to mention that uh, uh, decarbonization objectives for net zero carbon cities can be achieved by using hydrogen. Um, it's a key priority to achieve the Paris Agreement. And what we see is, as I mentioned, many countries today introducing legislation. Uh, but what, what we need is more uh, a better supportive framework for private sector investments and innovation. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for this interesting presentation. Uh, I'm sure that our audience uh, got a lot of good knowledge, updated knowledge on the subject, and uh, it has provided a lot of the latest updates in the hydro technologies in relation to cities and decarbonization, which is very useful for our discussion. I want to remind uh, the audience that the question and answers window is open. Uh, for them to upload the questions will be answered uh, after our panel discussion. I'm sure that the audience of this webinar want to learn more on the technology, challenges, and what needs to be done to move forward. So it's my pleasure to open this panel discussion. And initially, I would like to ask both Professor El Makimbi and Mr. Sutherland uh, how hydrogen can be used towards decarbonization? What can, can you add uh, on the great presentation that Dr. Topriska just gave us? Uh, Professor Makibi, first, please. Thank you very much. And thank you, Dr. Evangelia, for, for this uh, nice presentation. And it's a holistic presentation that shows the opportunities that are, are given by, by, by this technology. I think for concerning the, the building, first of all, uh, it's, uh, there is a huge opportunity to use uh, green hydrogen in building because uh, building is one of uh, the most uh, energy consuming sector in the world. So we, it depends on the, on the countries, but it is almost around 30, 30 to 35% of energy consumption compared to industry and uh, transportation. Also, building activity is uh, uh, one of the most greenhouses 
CO2 greenhouses uh, gas emission. And an example of Europe and France, we are about 25% of emiss emissions. And uh, how uh, green hydrogen can be uh, used in order to achieve decarbonation uh, in my sector, for example, in building, you know, we can achieve it considering the, the whole life cycle of, of building, not only the usage. For example, uh, uh, we should uh, consider a kind of holistic approach why, uh, while designing, constructing, using, and destroying buildings. For example, what I call um, gray energy. Gray energy is the energy that is used to manufacture the building materials. So uh, if we, for the moment, we are using a lot of uh, aluminum, glasses and concrete in building and these materials are using uh, fossil energies. So, uh, and this is the, they are the principal uh, responsible of the uh, greenhouse effect uh, emitted by buildings. And if we are using, for example, uh, hydrogen, uh, green hydrogen uh, to, uh, to produce these materials, could reduce a lot of uh, a lot of CO2 e emissions. Another thing is we have also to consider that uh, because the problem of uh, uh, of building and how you can use uh, green hydrogen is not only the storage or the production. It's also how to adapt the activity of buildings and the usage and the designer and occupants and users uh, behavior to convert them to the usage of this technology. Because there is one problem is the cost. You mentioned, uh, Dr. Evangelia mentioned that the cost is decreasing uh, uh, in, in time, but also there is, we face the same problem with PV panels. So if we are using the PV panels, the uh, we shouldn't experience the same mistake because now in some countries we are only renting our roofs. We are not using the PV panels in the building. So we are renting our roofs and we are sending the PV panels to the grid. So the idea here is to, uh, to use the uh, green hydrogen and to avoid this mistake. How to avoid this mistake is to completely change the paradigm of designing, using, and, uh, and uh, recycling buildings. How? Uh, I, I will not be long. I will have just one or two minutes uh, to, to explain this. How is, for example, to reconsider the indoor air conditions in buildings. So we will not focus on very, very low temperature in summer, for example, and very, very high temperature in, in, in winter, uh, because we will not have enough power with this technology at the beginning to reach this indoor air condition. So we have to convince the user that they have to, uh, to, to be patient and also to accept some fluctuation in the indoor air quality, the time we are adapting this, techno uh, this technology, for example. Understandable, building, fully understandable. The complexity is not only the production, but also the integration and usage. Professor, thank you very much for your answer. I think you have covered anything that has to do with hydrogen in buildings. Uh, I, I would like to ask uh, Mrs. Sutherland the same question, but let's move a little bit outside of the buildings and see the whole city. I would like to hear your opinion based on your expertise. Uh, sorry, I think you're muted. Okay, sorry about that. Yeah, um, thanks for the question, uh, Dr. Yanis, and um, thank you, uh, Evangeli, uh, for the uh, presentation. I'd like to to pick up on a, on a couple of points from the presentation. Um, you know, one is one is about hydrogen it, itself. You know, and um, hydrogen, as um, uh, Evangeli mentioned, is is an energy carrier. Um, and in, in that way, it's more similar to, 
to a, a fossil fuel in, in terms of how you can consider its usage. Um, so, you know, when we're thinking about um, hydrogen as a, as a means to decarbonization, we're thinking about opportunities to use hydrogen in applications where currently fossil fuels are used, but obviously we, we don't want to use fossil fuels any longer because of the greenhouse gases that they're emitting. Um, and, you know, some of those applications are, are transportation applications, um, but particularly the, the, the heavy end of transport, you know, because if, we, if we're looking at, at, at what hydrogen can do that battery electric vehicles can't do, it's very much more in that, in that heavy end of, of, um, of, of transportation. So by that, I mean uh, freight logistics, um, trucks, um, uh, rail applications, you know, so around the city, uh, commuter rail applications and, and intercity um, rail applications, where hydrogen becomes a much more uh, cost efficient mechanism to, um, to, to, uh, to produce an electric system. You know, you're using the hydrogen through a fuel cell to generate electricity, and then the electricity creates the, the, the propulsion um, mechanism. So I think in, 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 that, in that respect, um, hydrogen has got a very significant um, part to play in decarbonization. And I think the other, the other aspect is in energy storage as well. Um, because again, we've got this sort of competition between batteries and hydrogen, you know, as both as, as mechanisms for storing energy. And they both have, have their place. But when you start to scale up, um, batteries start to become less cost effective. Um, and, you know, and, and come up against limitations. You, know, you can't store electricity in batteries for long periods of time. You can store energy in hydrogen virtually forever. Um, and, and so when you're looking at coupling hydrogen with renewable energy sources, wind and solar, um, I think that's where hydrogen has a big part to play. Absolutely great point what you may, what you stated here. Uh, and I think it's quite interesting for the audience to understand the decarbonization, their targets, national targets, but we missing one point that there is a population growth and there's a lot of growth in countries that actually around the Gulf countries, around the UE, in Africa and the East. And as the population will grow, there will be more demand for vehicles, for, for powering the vehicles, and of course, for increasing the energy intensity uh, of users in commercial and residential. So that's a great point. Uh, I, I would like to, to go a little bit back to the technologies, mm -hmm. what technologies are coming out. And I would like to, 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 to ask Dr. Evagelia, uh, I mean, we, we have discussed about what is happening overall, but do you believe there are any trends or new technologies or technological advantages that will make the leap or provide something new based on your research and what you're doing within the academia? And of course, I have the same question for Professor El Mankidi. I'm coming back to you. All right, thank you, uh, Yanis, for the question. Uh, well, when it comes um, to something innovative that um, what we see today, in, when again, in hydrogen technologies and applications, we have many parts. So we have the, the generation part, which is uh, in green hydrogen is electrolysis, really. Uh, and then we see many different types of electrolyzers today. We have mainly today we use the alkaline electrolyzers and the PEM electrolyzers. So I would say that what, what we see today is um, a trend to use more PEM electrolyzers, uh, that they are more expensive and they used to be more expensive because of the materials, but they have many advantages in, in terms of safety, in terms of coupling with renewable energy, they tend, the cells tend to perform much better. So there is a focus on how to replace those materials with cheaper materials, and then we can use more PEM electrolyzers. Uh, then, of course, when it comes to the supply of the electrolyzer, again, this has to do with what we see in renewable energy uh, sources. So today, there is a big trend to use offshore wind 
there are many projects in uh, now that are planned to be built in the future that will use uh, utilize uh, energy generated by offshore uh, wind farms. Um, also, when it comes to the distribution and storage part, uh, then there is a lot of focus there uh, on uh, how to, we can distribute through pipelines. Uh, uh, in Germany, for example, now there is discussion to have a separate hydrogen network, not mixing with a natural gas network. And then as far as uh, my research is concerned, I have done work on uh, metal hydride, which is a promising technology when it comes to storing hydrogen, because we don't store as a compressed gas storage, which is a traditional method used in transportation, for example. We store in a solid form and under low pressure. Uh, but the problem is it's still quite expensive. So we still need a lot of work in that. But I believe that metal hydride is, is a very safe and good option for domestic applications for the future. Thank you very much. I think it's great now for the professor to pick it up because I'm sure he can share some of the research that they've taken and be involved in. Okay. Yeah. Okay, it's, it's for me. Yes. Yeah. Uh, this. This. Uh, I think also that uh, when we are talking about the production of the of the hydrogen of the green hydrogen, uh, we uh, almost uh, think about the the large scale and uh, uh, and the huge the great uh, production quantities and. Uh, it's when we are talking about uh, wind electricity, offshore wind electricity, for example, and uh, big uh, PV fields, it, we will also generate some um, uh, storage is issues and so on. But if we focus on the, I, I will always take in the scope of the building, okay? So, because it's my, my field. Uh, if, uh, if we focus on the, on the building and, we can also produce this uh, green hydrogen in a small quantities, uh, maybe uh, more expensive than the large scale. And uh, why, for example, we can use the PVs and uh, in anaerobic uh, digester with the pretreatment of food waste, for example, and, uh, and uh, waste coming from, from building. And with the post treatment, we can this can generate CO2 and methane. And if we can use the PVs to generate CO2 by electrolyzer, for example, we can uh, we can manage to combine the anaerobic digesters and uh, el electrolyzers to produce what we can call catalytic methanization. And then we can store it, and with this will uh, Im implement fuel cells and also. Uh, produce methane for cooking or heating, for example. This is at the scale of, of the building. It will generate, in my idea, I don't know any project using this, this idea for the moment, but it will, it will produce the needed uh, energy to be stored or to be used uh, in build, at the level of the building. We can also uh, uh, think about, uh, you mentioned Dr. Evangelia, the heat island, uh, heat island uh, issue or problem. We can also use it and produce it to, uh, uh, to uh, and implement it for heating and cooling, urban heating and cooling, for example. But uh, we also need uh, a new gener generation of equipment. I am also doing a parallel between the PV uh, technologies and uh, hydrogen technologies, for example. We are working now on a H2020 project uh, uh, on trying to gather all the existing technologies and integrate them in, in the building, taking into account, as mentioned, the, the occupants and manager behavior. And uh, uh, we also experienced a direct connection of PVs to the, uh, to the heat pumps. You know, uh, PV is a DC current, and heat pipes is alternative current. So there is a new generation of uh, DC, uh, DC current or uh, DC heat pumps that will be directly connected to the, to the PVs. So this is what we need also 
for green hydrogen. The production is a very, very big problem and it is being solved as Dr. Evangelia mentioned. She, uh, but we need also to produce a new generation of equipment and also uh, systems in building and urban uh, area that can uh, be uh, adapted to, the, to this new technology. Thank you very much. I mean, uh, you're at, we're at a great point in the discussion where we see what is the possibility. We see a lot of projects, and I believe there are more projects uh, right now in addition to the projects we we'll present as part of the presentation. Uh, I have a double question for Mr. Sutherland on the basis he's a practitioner. He works in the industry. And the discussion of hydrogen economy started almost 20 years ago. It appears that the green hydrogen for energy has a momentum this year. Uh, in which sector of the economy do you believe the hydrogen can contribute the most right now? And of course, the key question is how, uh, how we can move to the next step and what's the current challenges in the industry to introduce more green hydrogen within the projects and the, in, in the cities? Yeah, thank you. Um, look, I, I mean, I, I think hydrogen has a role to play in generally most sectors of, of our economies. Um, and, you know, as I said, uh, transportation is one of them. As um, Dr. El Mankiwi is talking about, you know, the built environment is, is another. Um, but, you, but then beyond that, you know, I, I would say the, the industrial sectors are um, probably even more important. You know, wh when we look at uh, global greenhouse gas emissions from, from heavy industry, um, I think it's around about 30%. Um, and then if you look at where the potential solutions are going to come from to decarbonize those, those industries, um, really there, there, there aren't any other options than to use um, hydrogen as, as some part of, of, of the solution there. Um, we've also got other sectors such as um, aviation um, and, uh, and shipping. And I think those, again, are, are two big areas where there really aren't other kinds of technologies um, than, than hydrogen as being part of, of the solution. Maybe not directly hydrogen, you know, because you can turn hydrogen into ammonia or you can turn hydrogen into synthetic fuels. Um, but, it, but, if, but if you then follow on your, your, your question, you know, what are, what are some of the challenges that are currently preventing us from adopting hydrogen at scale, um, you know, in, in these sectors. Um, it, it, it's, it's, a, it's a combination of, in some cases, the technology is not quite there yet, particularly relating to, to heavy industry applications. Um, and, and it's a question of, um, of, of if you like, the unit price of using the technology because you know, it, to, to a large extent, um, the equipment that's required, you know, right now is, is more expensive than, than the fossil fuel alternatives. But the reason for that is that they're not being produced in large enough quantities to bring down the, the unit price. So there's sort of a, 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 a chicken and egg situation here that, you know, we, we need large applications of the technology in order to create large orders for manufacturers to bring down to bring down the cost but until those orders are put are put in place the cost is going to still remain you know quite high and i think that's where the the role of government becomes very important um, putting in place the, the the policies that are really needed you know, to in encourage investment in, in, in hydrogen technologies um, and putting in place, if you like, the, the constraints that, 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 that continue to, uh, that, that would penalize the continuing, you know, emission of, of, of greenhouse gases. Um, so, you know, there's a, there's a combination that's needed there um, of, of government policies and then subsequently large um, implementations of, of projects. And I think particularly in, in the industrial sectors, um, 
you know, where, where we need to reduce greenhouse gases from the production of steel, from the production of cement, from the production of fertilizers, um, all of which are products that we will need to continue to use in the future. Um, but we need to have confidence those products are being produced, you know, with low carbon um, technologies. Uh, you you pick, picked up a very great point, uh, mm -hmm. scalability and investors. It's quite interesting because almost 10 years ago, I had a discussion with uh, patent holders of fuel cells. And I asked them when the fuel cells will be big in the market. And I thought the problem will be the supply chain. And the response was, no, it's not the supply chain, it's the scalability. If we mm -hmm. had 100,000 or a million of those going the same time, the price will fall significantly down and the patents will flow to the market within 10 years. And that's one of the things that I have not seen happening. And, mm -hmm. and I heard from Professor McKinby exactly. So yeah. I would like to, to, to ask you a question. Uh, we, we have all these technological advantages. We have seen from the presentation of Dr. Vagelia a lot of projects in Europe, in the UK, in Asia, in, in the region here. Uh, what are the main challenges? I mean, we discussed one challenge right now, but what are the main challenges in transition from now to the future? Because we are all, all of us are interested to see what the future will be and how better will be. What needs to be done? Okay. Yes, yes, it's for yeah. you, Professor. I think, I think the, the, big, the, the, the big barrier is that there is still uh, fossil energy existing. And uh, the big barrier also is that it is cheap. Because I will give you uh, um, uh, an, an example with, related with transportation. In France, for example, and in other countries, we have uh, gasoline, we have uh, uh, gas for, uh, for, uh, for vehicles. And gas is really cheap, cheaper than gasoline, but people are using uh, gasoline because the technology is different, the risk uh, are different and so on. And now here, and there is a lot of, uh, uh, a lot of money who is, which is injected by the European Union in Horizon 2030, and also in the case of France by the, the Environmental and Energy Agency of France, uh, of France uh, in order to, uh, to, to encourage people to, to go through this uh, green technologies, not only hydrogen, but green technology. The, the, best, the, the, the big problem is that the end user, some of users are aware of this problem uh, of uh, in, environmental pro problem and CO2 uh, as, uh, as a green gas effect production, but there is still some cheap and very abundant technology and easy to use, which is coming from fossil. So, uh, so sometimes the end user is lazy. You know, he is not uh, given uh, given given himself the, the 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 possibility to to go through new technology. So. I, I think that the uh, breakthrough will come from the, uh, for example, uh, social house holdings. They are managing a lot of apartments and a lot of group of, uh, of housing. And also they, they will come, I am not a fan of taxes to tax the carbon and uh, because I am, as, uh, it's, it's a kind of brutal, uh, a brutal way to, uh, to, to, to introduce the, this technology. We, we need a kind of balance between advantages and disadvantages of fossils with advantages and disadvantages of, uh, of green technologies, for example. Because Thank we you. also experience this yes. with the wind, with the PVs. So uh, for the moment, uh, I think that there is uh, uh, I, I saw there is a question about who, who is interested and which countries are involved in this uh, in this area. I think all the countries. Yeah, sorry, I just wanted to step in. There's a couple of questions from the uh, are interested, audience. like uh, Europe and the uh, NSF are funded to go this, but now we have to help the end user 
to uh, not uh, use the, the, fo the fossil energy. So one way is to, uh, to bring some, some money from, the, from the, the countries in order to, uh, this balance will uh, make uh, uh, hydrogen and green energy more advantageous than other energies. This is, a, in my idea, the, the, best, the, the best way. Thank you very much, uh, Doctor. Doctor uh, Gouda, Thank you for 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 coming in. And yeah. I have seen I have seen the audience have already eleven good questions. Yeah. And we don't have a lot of time, uh, so uh, I, I have a couple of questions as well. So if we can go with a couple of lines answer to those, will be great because we have just ten minutes left, uh, and it will be great just to give the quick quick responses. Uh, Mr. Sunderland, uh, green hydrogen production utilization is a new technology, but cannot only be driven by the private sector and the investors. Do you believe there is a need for specific policies on green hydrogen economy? Can I answer that? Yeah, of course, that's for you. Yes. Oh, sorry. <laughs> um, I, I, I think one, one, yes, absolutely, the need, there needs to be specific policies to um, encourage, you know, the evolution of, of green hydrogen, um, you know, and, and you can see how those policies are starting to emerge. I mean, you just have to look at the example of California, um, which really is probably the leading area in the world in terms of encouraging um, the adoption of, of green hydrogen. Um, and, you know, and, and at the heart of, heart of that is, is the uh, low carbon fuel standard. Um, you know, which really does, you know, penalize the use of, of fossil fuels and encourage the use of, of, of low carbon, um, you know, fuels. Um, you know, and, and so I think, I think that's, what, that's one area that's, that's, that's really important for, for governments to do. But I think there's something that's probably more, more, um, more global that needs to be considered as well. You know, and particularly if we're emphasizing in this webinar um, the adoption of green hydrogen um, as opposed to any other type of hydrogen. You know, one of, one of the areas I think that, that is being considered and, and, needs, and needs to come to fruition is, is the certification of green hydrogen. You know, you know so that when you're, when, you're, you, when you're purchasing hydrogen, you know, either in bulk or as an individual uh, um, consumer, um, you have to have confidence that what you're buying has been generated from sources um, that can be considered to be, you know, renewable energy, so that the whole supply chain um, has been validated as being, you know, a, a, a green hydrogen. Um, and, and I think that's one area that's going to have to start to be, you know, really put in place at, at, a, at a global level so that you know, if one country, um, you know, say, you know, Australia is producing hydrogen and exporting it to another country, say Japan, then, you know, then there is confidence that, you know, because that, that, that hydrogen is actually from renewable sources, because there will be a premium put on, on green hydrogen, you know, people will be prepared to pay more for green hydrogen than they would be for blue hydrogen or, or grey hydrogen. So I think that's that's one area that needs further work. Absolutely, and the California example I think is leading the way. It's not something new; it has been developed for a mm -hmm. few years now. They have they start having the fuel stations. I'm kind of conscious with the time right now, so I'll appreciate if we don't spend so much time. We have about 12 questions from the audience, so I will go one by one. Uh, the first one I, has to do with the storage. Uh, I think the, Dr. Vagelia could answer that. Uh, hydrogen storage uh, is quite difficult for renewable energies, and they have to compete with battery storage. What advantages do, does uh, green hydrogen provide in regarding to operations, economics against batteries as we know them now? Okay, so green hydrogen and storage. Sorry, I cannot see the questions at the moment because I'm 
I had a problem with my connection. I'm logging in from the phone. So um, when it comes to batteries, I think previously, uh, I believe uh, Ian answered this yeah. question already. When it comes to large scale projects, uh, hydrogen is much more competitive than, uh, than battery storage. So hydrogen storage um, can have many forms, um, uh, compressed gas basically at this level. Uh, is much more competitive in terms of long-term uh, losses. It has negligible losses, basically. But batteries, we cannot store for that long period. We, and even at this size, will be much more expensive. And, and I understand um, by being pressurized, the calorific value by the, of the pressurized volume is, is much higher. So as, as, as that was something that was presented as part of your presentation. Yes, I mean, uh, the, the calorific value is high per unit mass. Yeah, exactly. uh, but hydrogen has very low density. This is why we need to pressurize it at very high uh, pressures, more than 200 bar, even 700 bar in transportation. This is when it comes to compressed gas storage. In order to have enough energy, yes, we need uh, th this kind of pressure level. But uh, th this is why, as I said, we put a lot of research now into uh, in trying to find alternative storage solutions uh, that uh, for domestic applications, for example, would be safer to have less, maybe uh, less pressure. Uh, we have cryogenic, which is uh, super, uh, stores hydrogen as liquefied, as a liquid. So we do have a lot of options when it comes to storage. Even distribution in the network is one of Thank them. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And considering storage within the buildings, what is the safety measures? I don't know, uh, Professor Makibi, as your expertise is in the buildings, could you add that? Are there any considerations to be given within hydrogen within buildings? I think the safety measures uh, uh, with hydrogen, uh, the, we, can, we can rely on the existing safety measures for the boiling ga gases and, and other, other gases for the moment. But uh, when we have it at the level of the building, there is no, in my idea, any other safety, uh, adding safety measures to, to consider because we are transforming hydrogen to methane and other, uh, other, other, uh, we're not using hydrogen to cook or to understandable, to understandable. Yeah. I just mentioned something here because Please. this is my research on the cooking part. So, what, yeah. what, uh, sorry, just uh, to add uh, that uh, hydrogen is odorless and colorless by nature. So sometimes when we burn it, yes, we can see a color in the flame because of combustion gases. Um, however, we need some extra sensors, for example, safety uh, sensors to uh, be able to, to, um, to show us if there is a leak mm -hmm. of hydrogen. Yeah. This is the main, uh, the main thing we can add. And yeah. of course, some backflash regulators, backflash regulators for the yeah. gases. And Mr. Sunderland, the next question for you. Regarding transportation, do you believe electric cars will win at the end of the day or hydrogen cars? <laughs> <laughs> Look, I, I, I think both will win at the end of the day. You know, there's, there's a place for um, battery electric vehicles, particularly, you know, at, at the, the lighter end of, of the spectrum, cars and light trucks. Um, but as I said before, I, I really don't see at the heavy end of the spectrum that the batteries um, will be capable of, um, you know, pulling, you know, heavy trains or heavy trucks, because the, the weight of the batteries themselves then becomes, you know, an issue in terms of, of power that is required just to haul the batteries. Excellent. Thank you. I mean, I, the next question is for all of you, but please provide just one country, which country right now is leading the transition towards green hydrogen? And do you think that the global climate agreements you specify targets and deficits, but please focus on the country, just one country. Dr. Evangelia, please. Which country do you believe is leading right now? <laughs> which country? I don't want to say country really, the European Union as a okay. whole. <laughs> <laughs> uh, El I agree with you, Dr. Evangelia. If we have the agglomeration of European countries, you could see that there is a lot of money who is, which is invested in this area. And Mr. Sunderland, from your experience from West. Yeah, well, you know, I, I would have said the, the EU, but um, as, as the UK is no longer part of the EU, I'll also have to add the, I'll also have to add the UK to that as well. Uh, yeah, thank you. So it seems that there is a lot of 
good research and outcomes will come from projects that are happening right now in you. And I believe they will be the drivers to inform and improve projects that happen in the world in the GCC as well. Uh, the next, we still have some questions. It's quite good that we still have questions. I'll go quickly. Oh. I would like to answer just the question about the price because there is some people who are asking about the price of this technology. Yeah, I would like to add something about the price because yeah. uh, what I've seen in the presentation today was the price is, is, is kind of flattering. Uh, but I, I'm a follower of photovoltaic panels technology for almost mm -hmm. 20 years. And I have seen how dramatically by new technologies, the price has been reduced to a level that now the last review by Lazard stating that large scale photovoltaic plants are more competitive than natural gas, the dual natural gas turbines. And this is within 20 years. So how we see the fuel cells development of cost to be reduced? And where do you think we're going to that? Yes, Dr. McKinney. Okay, so I, I think when uh, when I'm talking about the price, I will give the example of the France, uh, of France country. We are the almost the leading country in nuclear energy. Mm -hmm. So the development of the we are standing, we are producing a, a, almost eighty percent of our energy is from nuclear, and developing nuclear stations is really uh, expensive. So we we have we have we have spent a lot of money to develop this. So the price of hydrogen is directly, if we should pay the real price of nuclear energy in France, we'll pay four times or five times what we are paying now. So uh, I think, I believe that there is, there is a kind of, uh, uh, oh, the countries should take in charge the extra price. M M M Dr. Evangelia, you mentioned that we are paying uh, for five to six dollars. Uh, per kilogram of hydrogen. So because there is no, uh, the, the, the states and the countries are not taking in charge the development of this because we are paying the full price of the production. If, you, if, we, are, if, we, are, if we are doing the same with nuclear energy in France, the price of uh, the kilowatt, kilowatt hour of uh, electricity is 0.12. But we are not paying the real price. We are uh, there is a lot of a lot of hidden price, uh, hidden cost that is taken in charge by by the country. So I think there is a, when we uh, we are comparing the prices between technologies, we have to take into account what is uh, supported by the countries and what is not supported by the countries. This is, this is my, my my idea. So. Uh, if we want to compare a green hydrogen with PVs, with nuclear, and also with fossil, we have to remove all all the uh, all, all the subsidies that are given by the states to support the other energies. So we we can have a real comparison comparison because we are now announcing green hydrogen as expensive. But in my idea, it could not be expensive if we have the same behavior toward this technology. Uh, that's a good, very good point, and uh, there are a couple of questions actually. Uh, they they're moving the discussion forward. Uh, there, there is a lot of uh, I would say green energy potential in different sources, like in UK, in Europe, we have uh, offshore wind. Uh, in France, we have nuclear efficiency. It's not renewable; it's considered low, low, low carbon. In the GCC, though, we have a plethora of uh, environmental uh, powerful uh, characteristics like high solar radiation in, mm -hmm. a, in a large areas. I will look in the maps in the middle of Saudi Arabia, Oman, and, and down to Yemen, high wind spin velocities. Do you believe this will be a factor for having something not within the cities, but around the cities, potentially production of producing hydrogen localized level with, with, with renewable energy at the end of the day? Will be pure hydrogen production, green hydrogen. Yes, yes. For example, I think it's. Uh, I will give you another example. The uh, Morocco has developed and is also developing uh, uh, renewable energy. By I think Morocco has developed the first international um, solar production station in Wazazet. 
the name is Nur, and they decided, for example, to use it for directly to to uh, to the usage of of the industry. So, for example, we can we can use this kind of of uh, of uh, of uh, 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 of development to produce energy because we need to store. The big problem of generating electricity is the storage. If we are if we have electricity we have to use it and to use it uh, when we are producing it i think in wazalich we have two big stations the i think the, in terms of production we are almost in morocco we have the second i don't remember the second or the second or the first place uh, uh, internationally in terms of production can be used to produce hydrogen for, for example or the salinization of the sea water or, or, or what he what he really wants so i think uh, uh, you are right. In some countries, we can focus on this. Even in Australia. Yeah, exactly. I think if I speak kindly, remind me we have only five minutes left, and I appreciate that the audience has been with us for a long time. There are seven questions still, but I believe we can summarize them within two main questions. Uh, the first question will be to Mrs. Sutherland. It has to do also with the hydrogen infrastructure. And for example, uh, is the one of the questions is can the natural gas pipe services that already stole cope with hydrogen? Can hydrogen be used in cities as a replacement fuel? Uh, is it something can be done in developing countries? Uh, if you can summarize within one or two minutes, so I can make the final question to Doctor. Sure, sure. I think, I think the use of the, um, you, the, the natural gas grids that exist in, in, in many countries and cities to be repurposed uh, for use of hydrogen, is, it's a very interesting topic. Um, and, um, you know, there's a lot of, there's a lot of potential there. Um, but at the moment, there's also a, a lot of uncertainty. Um, you know, so there, 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 there is, at the moment, you know, some uh, applications where hydrogen has been blended into the natural gas grid um, in, you know, in fairly low um, uh, percentages. Um, the, the, the risks around increasing the percentages are, are with um, embrittlement of the, of, the, of the metal because hydrogen is such a small um, atom that it, it can penetrate through existing um, pipes and existing um, uh, connections. Um, so there's a lot of research going on at the moment to, to look at, at you know, how you can overcome those, those issues. If, if, you, if you were building a new um, gas grid right now in, in a city, I, you would be, I would encourage that, that grid to be built in the anticipation that hydrogen would be used in that grid at 100%. Um, it might not be possible right now just because the supply isn't there, but we should be building infrastructure right now in anticipation of the coming of hydrogen replacing natural gas. Thank you very much. And the last question to Dr. Topriska. What is the further scope of research in this field from the academia? What do you believe needs to be did in research and policies? That's the last question, and then we're going to close the panel. What needs to be done uh, more in research? Research, research, research and development, yes. OK. Uh, I believe uh, uh, it has to be, uh, as I said earlier, the costs for, for the electrolyzer stock. Uh, this can significantly bring down the cost when it comes to, especially to proton exchange membrane electrolyzer. Um, the, yeah, that would be number one for me. Uh, and then the storage, as I said, the storage also, we can improve uh, there uh, to make it um, uh, uh, less bulk in, in terms of um, pressurized gas. Uh, then, of course, uh, we mentioned a lot about policy, right? Yeah, we need incentives, we need government to in, uh, regulations to implement everything. But one thing I would just like to say is we need to also educate the public. We need to raise awareness about how about this technology. People should be able to um, uh, accept it in their houses, in their buildings. So uh, educational campaigns are very important as well. Thank you very much. And I would like to thank Hero Devote for 
holding this panel today. Uh, Dr. Oguda, uh, I will welcome you to close this session. Dr. Oguda, we cannot hear you, you're muted. Sorry, that's a um, classic um, uh, <laughs> being muted. Okay. Um, Thank you to our speakers for such an interesting discussion and also thanks to um, our audience for your participation. Um, I'd just like to advise you of the next um, webinar, which is mental health in the construction industry, what can be done. Uh, more details of this webinar will be communicated to you in this uh, in due course. Um, so that concludes today's program. Have a wonderful day, evening. Bye, stay safe, and um, you may now disconnect. Thank you. Thank you very Thank much. You. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you, everyone.